Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Diane Borkart? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime and offer my analysis. Diane Borkart was born in 1949 and grew up in Rochelle, Illinois. She married not long after graduating from high school, but her husband died in a work-related accident. She moved to Jefferson, Wisconsin to take a job as a secretary in a furniture factory. There she met a man named Reuben Borkart, who worked for the factory as a carpenter. Reuben grew up in Jefferson. He married a woman named Susan, who he met in high school. The couple had two children together, Brooke and Chuck. In February 1979, Susan was driving in a snowstorm and was involved in a fatal collision. Reuben connected with Diane because they had been through similar experiences. They both unexpectedly lost their spouses. When Reuben first met Diane, Susan had only been dead for a few weeks. He complained to Diane about how he had to raise two children alone. Brooke was three and Chuck was one. Reuben was frustrated and desperate for a romantic partner. Diane offered to help out with the children. She comforted Reuben. She would prepare him food and help him around his house, which he had built himself. Diane and Reuben had sex, and not long after, Diane became pregnant. Reuben's friends urged him to slow down, to take his time, but he refused. The couple married in October 1979, just eight months after Susan was killed. Reuben, Diane, and Reuben's two children all lived in Reuben's house. In June of 1980, Diane gave birth to a daughter, Reagan, who was her clear favorite. Diane was verbally and emotionally harmful to Reuben's two children, but treated her daughter relatively well. Diane stopped having sex with Reuben not long after Reagan was born. After Reagan was old enough for school, Diane took a job at a high school as a teacher's aide and study hall monitor. In 1988, she opened up a print shop where she sold items like t-shirts. She was a popular figure in the community, especially with teenagers. A few of them even worked in her print shop. However, her business was not financially successful. Reuben opened a woodworking shop and made cabinets. He did much better financially. The marriage between Reuben and Diane was not stable. The couple argued frequently and Diane would become violent on occasion. Reuben would try to defend himself without harming Diane, but she would often play the victim after attacking him and call the police. Law enforcement became familiar with the couple. In early fall 1993, Reuben was performing some cabinet work for a married woman. They started complaining to one another about how they didn't like their spouses and they were unhappy in their marriages. Not surprisingly, they started having an affair. In November 1993, Reuben made it clear to Diane that he was leaving her for his new lover. He filed for divorce in January of 1994. Diane was not too happy about this news. She approached his lover on one occasion and called her names. She also recruited teenagers from the high school to spy on her husband. Diane's friend said that she was devastated about losing Reuben she was shaking and crying. Diane did not know what to do. In the short run, she continued to live with Reuben. She slept upstairs, and he slept in the basement. Diane's violent behavior escalated. Reuben was on edge all the time. He was anxious because he thought that Diane may hurt him. He even put empty mayonnaise jars in the hallway leading to the basement door to make it difficult for Diane to sneak down the steps when he was sleeping. I'm not sure how that was supposed to work. Were they invisible mayonnaise jars? Like when the mayonnaise was gone, did he look down at the jar and say, where did it go? Seems like it would be pretty easy to defeat the security system. At one point, Diane threatened to remove Reuben's genitals, just like Lorena Bobbitt had done to her husband, John, in June of 1993 in Virginia. There weren't enough mayonnaise jars in the world to make Reuben feel safe. Diane was not shy about telling people about her problems with her husband. At the high school where she worked, 
She not only recruited the teenagers to spy on him, she complained to the teenagers about her relationship. She was looking for some type of solution. She wished that Reuben would just go away, like disappear forever. She claimed that Reuben was abusive to her. Diane made a particularly strong connection with a 17-year-old named Douglas Vest Jr., who went by the name Doug. Before moving to the timeline of the crime, let's hear a word from today's sponsor, Stamps.com. If you're a small business owner, you know how important it is to be ready for the busy holiday season. If you haven't started preparing for the chaos of holiday mailing and shipping, you're already falling behind. Luckily, Stamps.com has everything you need to make your life a whole lot easier. It's the 24-7 post office that you can access from anywhere. No lines, no traffic, no hassle. Use Stamps.com to print postage wherever you do business. All you need is a computer and a printer. And if you need a package pickup, you can easily schedule it through your Stamps.com dashboard. Rates are constantly changing. With Stamps.com's switch and save feature, you can easily compare carriers and rates so you know you're getting the best deal every time. And if you're running an online store, Stamps.com works seamlessly with all the major shopping carts and marketplaces. Get ahead of the holiday chaos this year. Get started with Stamps.com today. Sign up at Stamps.com slash Dr. Grande for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com slash Dr. Grande. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. In the divorce settlement, Diane was granted custody of Reagan and she was allowed to keep two motor vehicles. Reuben was allowed to keep custody of Chuck and he could keep his house and pickup truck. The court gave Diane until April 15, 1994, to vacate Reuben's house. After losing the ability to live in the house, Diane told her friends she had lost everything. Diane was unwilling to accept this outcome. She asked Doug Vest to kill Reuben. At first, Doug wasn't ready to jump aboard the murder train, but he changed his mind when Diane offered him $20,000, two cars, and her engagement rings. She wasn't promising to marry him or anything, I think the rings just didn't have any sentimental value to her anymore, so she thought she might as well use them as a form of payment. Doug recruited two other teenagers to help him, 16-year-old Joshua Yonke and 15-year-old Michael Maldonado. The trio drove out of town to meet a friend of Michael's and purchased a 410 shotgun. On April 2, 1994, 13 days before the deadline to vacate Reuben's house, Diane caused an argument with Reuben. She attempted to take a sewing machine that belonged to Susan from Reuben's house. When Reuben tried to physically remove the sewing machine from the trunk of Diane's car, she jumped on his back. He threw her to the ground in self-defense, which caused her to be bruised. She called the police, but they did not arrest anybody. They asked Diane if she could spend the night somewhere else. She decided to drive over three hours away to the residence of Susan's family. During the early morning hours of April 3, 1994, Easter Sunday, Doug, Joshua, and Michael arrived at Reuben's house in Doug's car. Only Reuben and his 16-year-old son Chuck were in the house at this time. Diane had taken the family's miniature schnauzer with her, a dog that barked at anyone who entered the house. Diane had created a miniature schnauzer-free zone of death. Doug had been advised by Diane that the shop door would be unlocked, but he and the other two teenagers could not find it. Eventually, the trio entered through an unlocked garage door. Joshua became scared, left the house, and waited in the car. Doug and Michael expected to find Reuben asleep in the basement, but when they reached the basement steps, they realized Reuben was awake and walking up the stairs. Michael used the shotgun to shoot Reuben once in the chest. Reuben fell down the stairs. As Reuben started to get up, Michael shot him a second time. Reuben was mortally wounded, but not yet dead. Doug and Michael then made their way to Doug's vehicle, met up with Joshua, who was already there, and drove away. They threw the shotgun and their gloves out of the window of the vehicle. The items were never found. After hearing the shotgun blasts, Chuck made his way downstairs and found his father bleeding. 
Chuck called 911 at 3.35 a.m. Reuben told Chuck that two men conducted the attack. He also said, I can't believe she would do this, ostensibly referring to Diane. A police officer who arrived on the scene also heard Reuben talk about two men. On the way to the hospital in an ambulance, Reuben died from his injuries. During the investigation, the police found two spent 410 shells. Chuck owned a 410 shotgun, and he was the only other person in the house. However, the police determined that his shotgun was not the murder weapon. Chuck was excluded as a suspect. There was no forced entry into the house, and nothing was stolen. The police thought that maybe Diane was involved, but they did not have enough evidence for an arrest. Nothing happened with the case for several months. Eventually, after a reward was offered, a teenager came forward and told the police that Doug, Michael, and Joshua were the killers. The teenager knew this because Michael told him. The police interviewed Doug, and he confessed right away. The police then arrested the remaining conspirators. Joshua was offered a plea deal in which he would plead no contest to second-degree intentional homicide and the state would recommend 13 years in prison. In a surprising move, the judge ignored the recommendation and sentenced Joshua to 18 years. He was released in 2006. Doug was offered the same plea deal, but after seeing how the judge failed to honor the state's recommendation for sentencing Joshua, he decided to go to trial. Doug was convicted of first-degree intentional homicide and sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years. Michael was convicted of the same charge and received the same sentence, except he will have to wait for 50 years to be eligible for parole. Diane was convicted of conspiracy to commit first-degree intentional homicide and using a child to commit a Class A felony. She was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 45 years. The earliest she can be released is in 2035, at the age of 85. Now moving to my analysis. Was Diane Borkart actually guilty of murder? She continues to maintain her innocence. Let's take a look at the factors both for and against the idea that Diane was guilty, starting with the inculpatory evidence. Diane's husband was shot and killed as part of a conspiracy that involved Doug Vest. Diane regularly had contact with Doug. Diane's defense team admitted that she complained to Doug about her marriage. Doug implicated Diane in the conspiracy. The teenage conspirators knew that Reuben was in the basement and appeared to have knowledge regarding the layout of the house. They didn't steal anything from the house. They were clearly there only to kill Reuben. A 19-year-old named Shannon Johnson, who worked at Diane's print shop, witnessed negotiations about the homicide between Diane and Doug. She also witnessed Diane giving money to Doug. Reuben's cousin testified that Diane had tried to recruit him to kill Reuben. Diane even gave him a hand-drawn map of the house. Diane just happened to be over three hours away when the murder took place. In addition to her daughter, she took the family's dog on the trip, which was very out of the ordinary. Diane had a history of violence in her relationship with Reuben. She was manipulative and controlling. Right before the murder, Diane suffered a defeat in court and was being kicked out of Reuben's house. Moving to the exculpatory evidence, Doug could have recruited the other teenage conspirators by himself. Maybe after hearing Diane's constant complaints, he thought that he could play the hero, like he really felt some type of connection to her and took the initiative to become a killer. That's pretty much it for exculpatory evidence. When considering all the evidence, do I think that Diane was guilty? Yes. I believe that she is guilty in reality and guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. This case is sometimes thought of as a close call as far as her guilt. For example, in Jefferson, the community was split about 50-50. But I don't see this case that way. I think there is compelling evidence as to her guilt. Now moving to the final item. How would I conceptualize this case? What do I think happened? This is just a theory, my opinion. When Diane's first husband was killed in a work accident, she felt cheated out of a life that she was destined to live. When she met Reuben and learned that his wife had tragically died, she saw an opportunity to rebuild, a chance to make up for 
lost time. In a sense, Diane absorbed Susan's legacy, kind of like the plot of the 1986 movie Highlander. This movie involves these ageless swordsmen who battle each other throughout the centuries. When one is victorious, through decapitating his adversary, he gains all the power the adversary possessed. This is how Diane felt about Susan. She was able to collect all of Susan's power. Diane wanted Susan's husband, her house, and even her children. She was unwilling to give Susan credit for any of her achievements in life and wanted her completely forgotten. For example, Diane hid the fact that Susan was the biological mother of Brooke and Chuck. She led Reuben's children to believe that she was actually their biological mother. Diane removed photographs and everything else connected to Susan from view, either by throwing them away or hiding them. And Diane refused to let Susan's name be spoken by anyone, ever. For Diane, it was about restoring this ideal life. She didn't care if Reuben was satisfied in the marriage or not. It never occurred to her that he might leave. When Reuben had an affair and announced that he would be getting divorced, Diane refused to lose the life that she had. She wasn't worried about losing Reuben, but rather his house and his money. One could argue that she thought of him as the next foe who she would vanquish. His power was his house and his money. Diane was determined to kill him and acquire his assets. Diane used her power of manipulation on Doug Vest and played the victim, although it was money that finally motivated him, not empathy. Diane's grandiosity, self-centeredness, and sense of entitlement did not have limits. Her narcissism was so pronounced, Diane believed that she had the authority to kill anyone in her path. Just like the tagline from the movie Highlander, Diane believed there can be only one. Those are my thoughts on the case of Diane Burkhart. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be as intriguing as an alarm system made up of miniature schnauzers armed with mayonnaise jars. Thanks for watching.